Well, good evening and welcome to this regularly scheduled board meeting slash study session for the Azusa Unified School District Board of Edu Education on November 15th, 2022. The time is now 5.33 p.m. and we will call this meeting to order. And we will begin with our flag salute. Next, we move to item 1.3, which is our roll call. Uh, board member Rodriguez Pena. Present. Board member Cruz Gonzalez. Here. And I, board member Greer, am here. Board member Arianes and board members Arianes and Bo will not be in attendance this evening. This takes us to uh, 2.0 and specifically 2.1, which is the approval of the agenda. Is there a motion on the floor? Make a motion to approve 2.1. Second. Moved by board member Rodriguez Pena, seconded by board member Cruz Gonzalez. Any discussion? Hearing none, we will move to a vote. And the motion passes three yes, the two absent. This brings us to 3.0 and specifically 3.1, which is public comment on agenda or non-agenda items. This is an opportunity for the public to address the Board of Education on agenda or non-agenda items. Individual speakers may be allowed up to three minutes to address the Board of Education on any agenda or non-agenda item. When the public wishes to address the Board on any agenda item, they may fill out a blue card, stand at the podium, or raise their hand while in Zoom attendance. The Board of Education members are not permitted to respond to public comments. The Board of Education will take blue card requests first, followed in order by speakers at the podium and then those in Zoom attendance. I will ask, uh, because we have some uh, moments to, to just celebrate uh, the, the legacy of Board Member Cruz Gonzalez here in a moment, if you do have a comment to make in regards to that, we'd ask that you hold that and we'll make some space when we get to uh, 4.1 for you to share those, those comments about Board Member uh, uh, Cruz Gonzalez. So with that said, do we have any blue cards or, or comment, public commenters? No, okay. Then we'll move on to 4.0 recognition and awards and specifically 4.1 recognition of Shielding Cruz Gonzalez for service as board member of Azusa Unified School District Board of Education. And I, I think it would be most fitting to just uh, begin that with a um, just really a, a, a thank you and even, a, and even a hand clap just for all that you've done. And, and your incredible uh, just just years of service, and of course there are many uh, who are here to to celebrate you. And I did want to begin um, that celebration by first calling up uh, Giselle from Senator Rubio's office. Okay, then uh, Danae from uh, Assemblywoman. Uh, Rubio's office. Good evening, everyone. My name is Danae Amaya. I'm the district director for the office of Assemblywoman Blanca Rubio. I actually wanted to introduce our newest district representative that will be covering the city of Azusa, which is Alexis Sanchez. He's going to go ahead and present these resolutions and then offer recognition as well. So we'll give a round of applause. Hello. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Sure. Um, my name is Alexis Sanchez, and I am the newest district representative for Assemblywoman Blanca Rubio. And I'm here today in honor of the honorees, member, board member Cruz Gonzalez and board member Greer. Um, so today I would like to, um, I am proud to provide this legislate, California Legislator Assembly resolution to Cruz Gonzalez, member, board member Cruz Gonzalez on her. Um, membership of the Azusa board, uh, Unified Board 
school district uh, since 2001. So thank you for your service. And I also want to congratulate member Greer as well for his um, presidency. And I have these uh, beautiful resolutions in honor of you guys. Oh, thank you. And uh, we also have representatives from Supervisor Solis's office here with us. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ryan Serrano. I'm a field deputy with the Office of Supervisor Hilda Solis. And on behalf of Supervisor Hilda Solis, let me say what an honor and a joy it is to be here today to mark this occasion for board member Cruz Gonzalez. As a member of the United Azusa uh, Unified School District Board of Education, faithfully and with honor, integrity, and great distinction, therefore, on behalf of the Board of Supervisors of the County of Los Angeles, Supervisor Hilda Solis, First District, hereby congratulates, commands, and sincerely thanks Board Member Cruz Gonzalez for her 21 years of exemplary service, commitment, dedication, and invaluable contributions to the Azusa Unified School District and its mission and extends best wishes for her on a happy, healthy, and rewarding retirement. Congratulations. And also from the city of Azusa, we have Mayor Robert Gonzalez. Got my bodyguard, so that's how that works. Um, and, and we didn't and we didn't bring anything for you, Adrian, because we know you have some more work to do. So. Sorry. <laughs> we brought you some socks. <laughs> We're just here to celebrate. Uh, and I think you've all heard the sentiment this evening. This is a celebration for Shalanin. Uh, to, to, to serve the public in any capacity is, is, a, is a journey. And Shalanin, obviously, you've done this for 20 plus years. And that said, volumes from the community uh, that has supported you. And you're, you're in the retirement mode of, you know, you did it on your term and, and you serve this community with, with pride and integrity. And, and we can only thank you uh, for what you've done for, for the kids 
in this community. Uh, you've represented us uh, in Sacramento well, and we know that your, your retirement uh, will be well-deserved. And we know that you have a little one now that, that you're going to pay a lot of attention to, and, and you deserve this. And so I'll allow these folks here to, to celebrate you and, and, and honor you uh, because you've deserved it. Uh, I'm joined this evening by our uh, Mayor Pro Tem, Andrew Mendez. Councilmember Eddie Alvarez. And Councilmember Jesse Avila. So we, we have some, some certificates and, and some flowers picked from uh, Eddie's garden. So, <laughs> so Jonine, come on down and, and let's, uh, let's have Eddie while you do the certificate. Well, Sheila Ning, congratulations again. 21 years. Where does the time go, right? I mean, it went by so fast. I just have a, a certificate I'm going to read real quick. In recognition of Sheila Ning Cruz Gonzalez, Board of Education, the City Council of the City of Azusa, unites on this occasion to thank you for your 21 years of devoted and dedicated service to the Azusa School Committee, Community, uh, signed by the Honorable Mayor Robert Gonzalez and the rest of the City Council. And congratulations, and again, here are the flowers picked from Eddie's garden. And I don't have an actual speech prepared, and in in, since Jesse gave you the flowers from Eddie's garden, and Eddie gave you the, of course, the proclamation, I just wanted to congratulate you. 21 years is an incredibly long time. I've been on now two and a half-ish years, and that seems like a long time to me. So 21 years, in a good way, in a good way. <laughs> the Tribune's going to quote that, watch. <laughs> But 21 years, Sheila Nina, is is literally a, a significant chunk of your life. And I wanted to thank you because I, I know in this position, sometimes there's decisions that sometimes we don't want to make. And there's decisions, particularly in the last several years that we've made, the board has made, excuse me. And to that, that took incredible courage. And I congratulate you for that, in addition to the board as well. So congratulations to 21 years. Congratulations to Azusa for having you and being able to take from you for those 21 years. Thank you so much. And before we take a picture, I just wanted to recognize the former mayor, Christina Cruz Madrid, who's in the audience as well. So. Gentlemen, let's. And I did want to, uh, but before I ask my, my colleague if, if she has anything to share, I want to see if there was anyone else here that, that wanted to speak um, and, and, and share a comment uh, this, this evening. Oh my God, I am so proud of my lovely wife. Jeronine Cruz Gonzalez. Um, when I first met her and I had learned that she was uh, elected a lot longer than I was, I was like, she's got more experience than I do. Probably smarter than I am, <laughs> which she is. And so um, it's been a, it's, it's been a wonderful journey with you. And um, I've enjoyed um, learning how uh, school board folks uh, do your business. I've, been, I've enjoyed also uh, tagging along to some of your school board conferences and getting to know a lot of your colleagues and just growing our network of friends or circle of, of some of them become family. And so I, I'm very proud of you, love you, and uh, I'm enjoying to now. I'm looking forward to having uh, more time to spend with you. 
So thank you for uh, giving us back my wife. Good evening. My name is Victor Gonzalez. My, my, she's my, my daughter. I just want to share with you how it all started. She had just come back from MIT in July. Graduating in the middle of June. I stayed out two extra weeks. I, in the first, first week of July, I was going with this to put a room for off. I was the uh, PTA president, other, somebody else. And she said, Dad, I'm more qualified than run. I didn't say anything. I was happy. Though. I didn't say anything. And then on the Wednesday before the Friday to, to the deadline, she says, Dad, let's go. Donde? Sign up. Sign up for what? Run for focus. She took out her papers, brought them home, and on Friday she said, Dad, let's go. We're two. Like, let's like, I was. <laughs> and she said, to go turn them in. Oh, okay, let's go. So we turned them in, came back to the car. She said, I forgot one paper, so I'm not really running. What, what, what paper was that? Statement. I knew she was. Next morning, paper said, she only is running for office. She's running. She wanted to back out, but she didn't run. She come back out. She was, she was running. And she won. And she won because she was lucky to have the backing of the union. In fact, she was part of a group of eight candidates. Eight candidates that ran that uh, election, and they all won. She was wonderful. It seems like yesterday. Now look. 21 years later, still the same. I'm the same. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, okay. I didn't plan on doing this. Uh, so my first experience with Sheila Nino was like many of you coming to these board members and, and then following up with emails and driving you all crazy. Um, and from seeing your poise and the way you would represent, represent the community, I had a lot of respect for. Um, then through the opportunity of our children being in class together, I've had the honor of getting to know you and that you truly speak for children as if it was your own. The way you advocate for your son, for your child, and those experiences and opportunities you want to give him is what you have worked so hard to give to the community. And when I first got involved and somebody said, you want to make change, talk to Sheila Nino. <laughs> and it's been an honor witnessing that and to now call you a friend and to know that it doesn't end here because I know that you're constantly doing things for the community. And I thank you for being a person with virtue and values that models it and walks your talk. So thank you. Congratulations. Anyone else? Then I will turn to uh, my colleague, board member Rodriguez Pena. Let me get my Kleenex out. So, you know, um, in, in uh, 2001, I do remember Shilonin and her dad at La Flor de Mexico back in the days when she first ran for office. And I'm like, well, that young girl, you know, she's running for school board. Wow, you know how impressive I was that she had the guts and the nerve to do it. Because it's not easy when you want to run for office or you want to make a difference as young as she is, was, you know, I know her family for over 20 years, but then Shilonin comes, you know, and she has always given her heart to the students here of Azusa and also to the community. That's how I know her, but um, I can't look at you. And um, the thing is in, in 2011, she comes knocking on my door to what, to recruit me and say, Hey, Yolanda, there's a, a school board, um, uh, seat open. You want to run? And I'm like, okay, sure. come on, I'll help you. Okay, sure. So I come in, but you know, Shironin has been so young. She has been my mentor. She's been, been my mentor since day one. She took me to CSVA, CLSVA, introduced me to a lot. Of, everyone knows her. They go, oh, you're in Shironin's board. I'm like, uh, like, it was her board, right? Because everyone knows her that way. I'm like, no, it's a Zusa board. But you know, I'm like, you know, how could she be so smart? You know, I'm here the first year and I'm, she knows everything. And I'm like, but I had to realize, Yolanda, you've been there one year. She's been there 10 years. But I always looked up to her. She came to my house and showed me how to do the agenda, 
how to follow it properly. If I needed any help, I knew I could always turn on her. She was one of the best board members that you can ask for. I'm going to miss her because her knowledge is incredible. Not only knowing a lot of people, she knows a lot of programs. She knows the right direction. She knows the right thing to say. I am going to miss her. Um, sitting across from me for all this time. It's like a marriage, right? We've been through thick and thin. We've been screamed at. We've been kicked at. We've been yelled at. We've been congratulated on. And we all stick together. We all stick together. So I am going to miss her truly. She don't need. I'll miss you. And I'll say, I, I think back, yeah, on, on just the, the, the pleasure of being able to serve with you on this board over the, the, the course of these past four years. And, and just thinking the, the roller coaster ride that was this past four years and recognizing that you have, have been here and you have ridden those, those highs and those lows here in this community, continuing, as so many have already said to advocate for, to speak on behalf of, to be a voice, to, to promote, elevate, and platform the voices of others. Um, you have, have been a, an inspiration to me as I, as I look to what it means to be a school board member. And, and, and yeah, it's incredible as everybody has shared the ways that you have not only been a mentor, but, but also just your, your, your brilliance and, and the ways that you bring that to, to this board to this district and to this community. And so we, we wouldn't be who we are without you having been uh, just such a strong part of this team for so many years. And we are, we, we celebrate you as, as you, you head out, but we also, you know, definitely recognize the, the loss uh, that we have uh, with you not no longer sitting around this table, but are so grateful for the times that we had, for the votes that you've made, for the tough decisions that you've needed to, to weigh and consider. Um, and I am just personally grateful uh, to know you as a, as a colleague, to know you as a friend, um, and and to to share in this community um, with you. And so I just want to personally say congratulations to you. And I also have this uh, on behalf of the Azusa Unified School District. We have. Awarded to Shielding Cruz Gonzalez in recognition and appreciation for your service as a member of the Board of Education of the Azusa Unified School District from 2001 to Or President, before uh, we let Ms. Shilin Cruz go, as I say, absolutely. <clears throat> Just want to say on behalf of uh, Cabinet, um, everything that has been uh, said today. But I, I want to, I want to, I want to just make it loud and clear that um, Shilin Cruz Gonzalez's impact in Azusa goes beyond Azusa. Um, it is uh, her presence is felt uh, across the state. Um, not only in her decisions, uh, but her work, uh, her advocacy, her uh, relentless um, um, championing of what is right for students. Um, obviously, right, she's here in, in our home, Azusa, but the ripple effects are real uh, and the real ripple effects uh, go extremely broad. And so uh, we just wanted to say thank you. Uh, thank you for being um, such an amazing board member, such an amazing partner. And just on behalf of the kids and the uh, and, and here, the district, uh, we just want to thank you and congratulate you. And then, of course, you know, we certainly would love to give you a moment, Shilanine, to, to share. 
Thank you. Um, and I, I didn't prepare anything because I really didn't want to speak for very long. But um, I do first want to just acknowledge and thank my family for being here. I have my parents, Victoria and Victor, my grandmother, Caroline Cruz. <laughs> My, my cousins, Adrian, Joaquin, and Roger are all here. Um, uh, two was just a grad, or, or two was just a unified grad. Um, um, and my, my aunt, my tia Andrea, my sister, um, and then, of course, my family, my husband, Tony, and my son, so not you, who's back there with his friends. Um, his dual immersion friends, yes. Yeah. Um, and so I, I also want to just recognize, you know, I don't think I would have run for school board at 26 if I didn't have the pathway um, except for me with my grandfather being on city council and my aunt sitting as, a, as the mayor at the time, right? I think when I thought about wanting to do change, um, that I, saw the, I, saw the, I saw the mentors, I saw the, um, the examples, and that's where my mind went, right? So I think I have to really acknowledge the fact that that, that existed for me to be here. I will also just say, um, my dad told the story about me running. I actually, that Friday after I pulled the papers, I actually planned on not running. But it's when the Tribune announced and on the Sunday newspaper wrote everyone who was filed. And my cousin, my cousin Roger called me up. He's like, you're running for school board. And I was like, that's it. I have to run. Now my name's up. That's right. So because I had fully intended on not doing it. So it was sort of an accident that I ended up having to, that I ended up running. Um, but, I, you know, I just want to say two things. And one is um, I never thought I would serve this long. I thought, oh, yeah, I'll get in there. I, I, you know, I'm always focused on my outcomes. Right. So I was like 12 years. I'll run a couple of times and then I'll move on. Right. Schools changed so slowly, incredibly slowly. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I still, I, I can't, I can't honestly say like, oh yeah, we are, we're, we are where I would want us to be. Right. But I think I've done my part. Um, um, I think I've helped push this district um, to be a better place. Um, and more importantly, there are so many strong things in place. There's so much strong leadership on our board, a board, you know, we have a board who understands the importance of equity and the importance of um, ensuring that every single of our students has a has the ability to succeed and thrive, right? Not just educationally, but as a whole child. Um, and so I feel really good about stepping down and moving on and moving on to something local like Cub Scouts instead of school board, um, <laughs> because I know I know that the district is in good hands with my fellow board members and with the leadership that we have in our schools and the and the teachers that we have in our classrooms. Right. Every 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 teacher that my son has had so far has been excellent, excellent, and it's just amazing what they're learning. And so, um, I you know I I feel good about that. I feel good about where I'm leaving. And I think what what's important for leadership is not what you've done right, but what happens after you leave. So I really look forward to seeing what happens, right? It, throughout the years, by the time my son graduates from gets into high school and is part of the IB program, um, and uh, graduates from high school to see where our schools are. In, in the next 10 years. Um, someone asked me if I'm going to watch board school board meetings. I said, no, I am not going to watch the board meetings. Um, so I, but, but I'm sure you guys are going to have fun with those board meetings and make some really great decisions. Um, and so I, I'll leave it at there and say just thank you so much. I appreciate the support of the community. I've so appreciated um, representing the community and really asking for more from our, from our agents, from our school district, from, from the people that serve our community. Um, and um, it's just been, I don't know, it's been very fulfilling and I, and I, um, but I'm also happy to, to let it, let somebody else take that first. So thank you. Yeah. And so let, let's get a picture with my family. So if they, all my family would come up. And I also wanted to just recognize all my friends in the audience, my, my parent friends, my, my, my fellow elected officials who came. I just really appreciate all of you coming and supporting me.
All right. And now this brings us to 4.2, uh, recognition of Adrian Greer for service as <laughs> <laughs> education president of Azusa Unified School District. Can we start? So um, I want to thank Adrian for taking this whole year as being board president. He did such a fabulous job. You know, he he's he's very young. You see that. And, you know, he would become board president and he was willing to do a great job. And I really appreciate his sentiment. I appreciate the way he handled situations. We went through some tough situations and he always stood his ground. And that's what a board president is. He ran the meetings very not smoothly. We just talked about, you know, our board meetings are not till 1030 at night. He's really managed to work with the superintendent and have our board meetings run smoothly. And that's his job. And he did a fantastic job at that. And I'm very proud of him for being such a nice young man and really doing a fine job. I really appreciate it because I have been here 11 years and I've seen different, there's people have different styles when they run, when you become the board president. And he has a smooth, look at him, slick style. I mean, he may be yelling at you. He may be mad and you didn't even know it. But I know him, so I look at him, and I can't look at him because I want to laugh, and he looks at me, and we're like, okay, Adrian. But I'm very, very proud of him um, for, for getting us through this very tough year that we all had to go through. So I have a, um, I thought the gavel came off, but it doesn't, um, a very nice plaque here presented to Adrian Greer in appreciation for your dedication and service as a board president of the Unified School District Board. Uh, December 14th, 2021, November 30th, 2022. Congratulations, Adrian. Do you have anything to say to him, Shiloni? Do you have anything to say to Mr. Greer? Um, well, two things. One, um, just so appreciate um, your leadership this past year over some really difficult decisions um, and some really difficult meetings. Um, and two, I'm really, I'm really excited that you decided to apply for that appointment and we'll be here <laughs> four more years. So I, 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 think, I think the district would miss you if you weren't here. So I really appreciate that. Can we take a picture over here, Mr. Greer? Do you want to say a few words, Mr. Greer? Uh, President Greer, I'm sorry. <laughs> or a couple more hours. Um, <laughs> no, just, just, just thank you. Thank you for, for your words. Thank you for uh, taking the time to, to share uh, your, the, your thoughts and, and appreciation. I appreciate it. This is not easy work, uh, but it, it's important work. Um, so it's an honor to, to have been on uh, this, this dais and continue to be on the, the, the dais uh, with you. Board Member Rodriguez Pena, and to have been on with you, Board Member. Thank you, Adrian. Well, now we will move to uh, 5.0 consent calendar, and specifically 5.1 and 5.2 that we see here on our, our consent calendar. And so is there a motion to approve? Um, our consent calendar. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. And there will be no discussion. And so we will go ahead and vote. And the motion passes three yes to two absent. Which brings us to 6.0, our study session, where we will uh, use the remainder of our time. And 6.1 specifically, which is presentation of Azusa Unified School District, pre-K to three coherence collaboration.
it's the boring part. No, I'm kidding. You, you're all welcome to stay, but this you're is going to be it. Yes. We're, we're transitioning to like to a meeting now. Yes. You're, welcome to stay. you're welcome to go as well. All right. We'd love for you to all stay. <laughs> we're good. You're free to go. <laughs> We could take a picture, Joe. Yeah, go, Joe. Okay, Joe, go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> All right, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good evening, Board President Greer, Board of Education, Superintendent Ortega, and Cabinet. Tonight, we are excited to share the work and journey of our P3CC pre K to uh, third grade coherence collaboration. Um, I am pleased to be a part of this amazing team and to be included in the amazing work that this team has done thus far in um, early mathematics through their partnership with the California Ed Partners and um, this improvement team. Um, we will be presenting with some of the members of this team this evening. I'd like to introduce uh, Jenny Lee, our Director of Early Childhood Education Program. Adriana Garcia Medina, our Director of Educational Services. Jeanette Flores, Principal of Victor Hodge Elementary School. Alicia Vargas Smith, the Resource Teacher at Longfellow School. And last but certainly not least, uh, Julie McGow, our Elementary Math TOSA. This is our third year um, of a collaboration with California Ed Partners uh, to build coherence between our early childhood and elementary programs, because as we know, great childhood early childhood programs are not enough for students. Research shows that the positive effects of early education programs were often not sustained after children entered kindergarten and elementary school. Often the results, often this results in a lack of articulation and coherence between preschool programs and elementary programs. The PACE PK3 alignment report clearly calls out the need for PK through third grade alignment in the areas of high quality learning experiences, adult collaborative learning, and assessment of learning. Work in these key systems supports our AUSD success drivers, High quality learning experiences for students include collaborative practices, academic rigor, and academic discourse. This is a theme that you will see throughout um, this presentation tonight. When we create opportunities for adult collaborative learning, principals, teachers, and support staff have opportunities to collaborate and have academic discourse, which deepens our understanding of high quality, rigorous instruction. The assessment of learning provides feedback for our effectiveness in applying success drivers, as well as insight as to how we can deepen our teaching practices. In 2020, AUSD was selected to participate in the California Education Partners P3CC grant. California Education Partners brought together districts from across California and expert thought partners from the Stanford De Development and Research and Early Math Education, the Dream Network, to work on a three-year process of aligning district systems and resources to provide coherent 
in preschool to third grade learning systems. Together, we have developed a lens for high quality early mathematics, reading, teaching, and learning, robust, robust third and thoughtful assessment practices, and coherent learning across preschool to third grade. After we started this work, the state of California identified the need for preschool to third grade alignment and the work of the district in pre-3CC is serving as model for how districts can align their learning systems. This means we have been and are ahead of other states in this work as well as in the implementations of UPK. At the beginning of this collaboration, we defined our team aspiration. At the end of three years, AUSD will have a well-established cohesive instrumental math, math plan from preschool to third grade in which adults collaboratively and systematically understand the system, use data to drive instruction decisions, and implement continuous improvement plans to meet the needs of all students, specifically bilingual learners, students with disabilities, and social economically disadvantaged students. It was very important for our team to examine all of our system with the lens of providing equity, access, and inclusion for all members of the AUSD learning community. Throughout this process, we have remained true to our aspiration and have also been focusing on how we can best meet the diverse needs of our multilingual learners students with disabilities, and students who are socially, economically disadvantaged. In the first year of our work, we analyzed assessment data uh, provided by our district assessment system. We also looked at what kinds of data were available and discovered that most of our assessments uh, did not lend themselves to cross grade level conversations um, and student about student growth. We adjusted uh, to the new realities of online um, instruction. Not sure if you have to click, I think. We shared uh, learning opportunities with teachers, uh, which shifted to an online platform. We also uh, participated in book clubs and had training with Megan Frankie uh, and her team from UCLA. As a result of these learning opportunities, teachers wanted to apply what they had learned about counting collections. Uh, so we learned to do counting collections online. Can you click? I think it's not coming in here two and your three. The, this slide shows you uh, how families shared their uh, collections uh, during distance learning and online uh, opportunities. Students had the opportunity to count objects from everyday life, such as their dolls um, and their Hot Wheels. And it was exciting to see our students learning uh, together at home. Next slide. One back. In year, okay, in year two, uh, we piloted counting collections um, and we also looked at a new problem solving assessment item. Uh, we also, in this year, we um, ensured that teachers were doing counting collections weekly uh, as we explored uh, using a high leverage uh, teaching practice. Um, and we were also piloting our new PK through second grade um, assessment. Uh, based on feedback uh, from our classroom teachers, our third through fifth grade uh, grade levels are piloting a new um, problem solving item for uh, the assessment this school year. Can I just add something to this? Just, can I speak now? Yes. So I noticed on the counting collection, I really enjoyed seeing it when it was online because parents were participating with their child at home and they were learning together. And I think it's really important that 
um, you know, the parent cannot come to school with them, obviously. But I think at this point, they did work with them on this Kanye collection and they were having fun with their child. And I think that was great to see. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It did give them a, a window into this the strategy that we were that we're implementing now as they were able to implement it at home uh, yes. with teacher support. Mm -hmm. So one of the first focuses uh, as a team um, was to implement counting collections. Counting collections is an opportunity for the children to work together with a partner um, to count a collection of objects. Students use their own strategies to organize their own personal collection. Some of the uh, high quality learning experiences that children benefit from during the counting collection is that students are able to count together with a partner. Um, teachers allow students to select their own collection from specific sets. For example, a beginner beginning counter might select um, from bags which might have five to ten objects uh, in the, in the bag, whereas advanced counters can select a bag that might have under two hundred uh, objects. Um, the, during the counting collection, the teacher interacts with students, asking questions and recording the strategies that the children use. Um, and another benefit is that the students also learn from the insights of their So we want to give you a chance today to actually try doing a counting question. So we are going to ask you to find a partner. Um, you are going to work together to select. We have quite a variety of items, so we'll bring them by for you. You need to decide together how you're going to organize your collection. Um, and if you decide you need tools such as a 10 frame or a 100 grid, we have those available as well. So we'll be bringing them by for you to come and count them collect. Okay. We need everything.
Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's good. That's
So you guys chose to use the large 10 frames, which are a favorite of mine. Um, so it gave you a visual. I like it the way we set, set it up this way because it's easier to count and it's more, I'm an on-hand learner. So visually it's spaced out and it's easier for me to count them. And you guys chose to count by? Twos. By twos. And also by five? You tried it both ways, but you had a preference. Yes. For two. Why was that? Because it's easier to count them. They're more familiar? Mm -hmm. More familiar. Mm -hmm. You guys, I saw you counted several different ways. Yeah, originally we started uh, just putting one in each bucket until we realized that we were definitely going to need to put a lot more than one in each each bucket. Uh, we ended up with ten in each bucket, so the, therefore we knew that we had sixty, but five left over, so we had sixty-five, and then uh, we're asked over and over. To, to think about other ways to, to rearrange it. And so we think we found a pretty efficient way of arranging that uh, where now we have five slots uh, with 13 in each. So still, so at 65. How about you? Oh, we already cleaned up. I didn't know. Um, Bob, that, so we, um, that's all right. Usually we ask you to leave it out so we can see for show and tell, but that's all right. Yeah, so we, we, um, we counted by 10. Well, first we, we first we had fun just dividing it by the what kind of by the kind of rock it was as much as we could, and then we counted by ten. That is something that we see a lot is that many of our students and we as adults really enjoy the sorting part, and that we tend to divide it and kind of sort it out first, and then we start counting. So there's a reason that we're doing this. This decides that it's fun, and I'm going to go back. So when we think about doing counting collections, for me, it's like having a window into student thinking. It gives me an opportunity to see if they have cardinality, if they have number order, one-to-one uh, -one correspondence, how they group. Um, it's also a chance for us to see our high leverage practices in action. We can actually see our students doing those things there in our classroom. It also matches what we've been talking about with our teachers this year, these six high leverage mathematical pedagogical practices. Let's take a look at these. Did we effectively solicit, elicit your mathematical ideas in doing some counting plans? Had an opportunity for that. Did you get to use tools and representations of your own choosing? You notice each group did this a different way. That's really important that it's not the teacher saying, this is how I want it done. This is a chance for students to develop their math. You know, I liked about it, Ms. McGall, is that, you know, each, every student has the opportunity of participating and it's not only just certain students, it's all the students working together. I really like that. It's really exciting. And mm -hmm. something I it's love about too. it as well as the kids love it. Mm -hmm. But it's also a, we're able to differentiate. So each of you selected a set that you were comfortable with. You selected a different size and teachers help students select a size that's the right stretch level for them. Did we ask you follow-up questions? Absolutely. Were we able to use, let's say this was a lesson, could I use what I saw in your mathematical thinking to then stretch to the next pack? Yeah, I gained a lot of information there. How about having math conversations? This is actually a district focus for us this year that we've selected. Having conversations in math class where students share their ideas with each other. Is that what you were doing? And then I hope that this one was true because this is very important to me. Did you feel that you were positioned as a capable mathematician? And the question was, you asked, why did we do it that way? So we had an have, have an answer why we felt it was best doing it by tens or twenties or by the bucket or whatever, you know, and that, that's also great too. It gives you a chance to be mm -hmm. able to express your thinking and show that you are competent as you do this. Mm -hmm. So as you know, um, we see our students doing this and you can see some of our students here in action. This is my favorite thing to be in classrooms to see 
because really what we see when we see these students doing this is that there is 100% of our students who are engaged in learning. It's one of those times where I can walk in and see every single student doing something that's at their just right level, that's meeting their needs, getting them ready, and laying that strong foundation for all that number sense to make them successful as they move forward. So counting collections is really a favorite activity as we One of the clear goals that we have for all of our students is for them to become problem solvers. Last year, we set a goal that 50% of our multilingual learners would be able to apply a valid strategy to solve a word problem. Oh. As part of our goal, um, we did this work with County Collections, and it led us to wonder um, if we were to start using County Collections on a weekly basis, would it help our multilingual learners and students with disabilities develop cardinality? Specifically cardinality referring to this idea that the last number that you said when you're counting describes the size of the set. So for example, I'm counting five, one, two, three, four, five. And then Arturo asks, Julie, how many did you count? If I understand that that last number describes the set, I have cardinality. I would say I counted five. If I have not developed that yet, what you'll see students do is Arturo would ask them and they would say one, two, three, four, five, and they would begin again because they don't actually understand how to describe that set using that number. So what we did was we recruited um, teachers who would pilot for us doing the counting collections weekly um, for six to eight weeks. They would collect data on cardinality specifically um, for six students. And we wanted them to choose students who were struggling with math. So we had English learners, students with disabilities and students who are socioeconomically disadvantaged. And we also had next step conversations. So Mrs. Vargas Smith and I would meet with the teachers and look at their data and say, let's put our heads together. What could we do next to help build the math understanding of these students? So if you take a look, you can see after just this six to eight week pilot, we saw some significant results with many of our students who had not made growth in this idea of cardinality throughout the school year, all of a sudden make a lot of we also saw that this was true um, with one of our target groups, which is our English learners. You can see in the next slide that specifically we saw some good growth in that. And as you know, the term emergent bilingual is also used for our English learners. You can see that they are growing, but the gap still exists. And so we want to begin to address that. We also saw the gap continued with our students with disabilities. So we want to continue to address that. So this year we have um, achievement data from the state testing, um, which we haven't had for a few years. So these are um, our third grade students, socioeconomically disadvantaged students um, with some comparison data to Los Angeles County and the state of California. We know that across the state, students in California were adversely affected by the pandemic, um, but we are looking forward to the work of the team and continuing to support that growth in mathematics. This slide shows some data um, that compares Azusa Unified socioeconomically disadvantaged students with other districts that are part of the P3CC collaborative. And now we have um, some voices from teachers um, and their experience with this work and with counting collections.
I think it's this way because it goes, yeah, yeah, it's this. I'm not. It sounds like it's the mic here. Okay. It's very helpful. Turn off audio. So if it seems like that's where we're getting the feedback. The time and effort to, to prep it because it pays off in the classroom. I was following um, about six kids and um, I've seen so much growth uh, with their number sense, um, learning place value, um, especially.
you had an opportunity to uh, hear All right, so you had an opportunity to hear teacher voices uh, regarding their experience with counting collections, and you also had an experience with counting collections here tonight. Um, and you see here the, the results of our uh, pilot showed that counting collections is an effective practice for all our students. Um, and as a result, we've selected it as a signature practice for PK through second grade uh, elementary math programs. Uh, and by signature practice, we mean that you can expect to see uh, counting collections implemented across all elementary classrooms. Uh, we launched it as a weekly signature practice in the fall, and we can't wait to see the continued growth that our students will show. Um, in fact, uh, based on the data that was collected from uh, counting collections, uh, our math leadership team replaced the old district assessments with uh, counting collections data uh, piece in order to focus on problem solving for our students. Can I ask a question? So when you say across all grade levels, so you're talking about preschool or TK to fifth to sixth grade, or what, what grades are you talking about? It would up be to third grade. It would be up to PK through second grade. And they're all doing it. it, it should, it's a signature practice. So they're doing it at least once a week. Um, and because it's a signature practice. And so how, how does it look different than as the, let's say a kid that I could see like this year you have kids doing it new, right? But what about a kid that started in TK and now they've been doing it TK, kinder, first, second? So, so how does it, how will it look different in a couple of years when these kids have done, been doing this same thing for four years? So in, in every class, you're going to have varied abilities, right? And so your little ones might start with the smaller collections. So they might be working on zero to five. Uh, objects, they might be make, make their way up to 10 objects. But if you're thinking about maybe a second grade class, you're going to have those larger collections where maybe they're counting 50 objects or 60 objects, and they may be grouping uh, by fives. They may be grouping by twos. Uh, so it just depends on what's, what uh, grade level you are seeing. And then based on what collection they're, they're using, a teacher would differentiate by asking questions, right? And so those questions will lead them to organizing some of the questions that you may have heard as you were working on your own collection was, can you show me a different way to organize or what might be another way that you count? So it's those questions that prompt the students to take their uh, skills to a higher level. As, as they grow in, and work on the larger collections, the kinds of questions that we ask will change. So we might be asking as they're younger questions about if we add one more or we take away one, but we are asking your group about really division questions and being able to think about if we divided this into these groups, how many, and you had these many left over, could we divide it a different way and have fewer left over? We divide it again so that they're really integrating some multiplication and division as they do that. They can also begin to work with much larger sets, even sets like boxes that would say, I have thousand staples in this box. We only have 500 in this box and 1,000 here. How would you group those together? So there's a lot of different ways that we can change that as they grow. So then how are teachers being prepared to have those kind of, ask those kind of questions that are really appropriate maybe for the, where the level of the child is? A great question. I'm asking. Yes. <laughs> um, we have been working on this actually for many years, even before we started our P3CC work, we had begun training for teachers. Um, and now we're really shifting into saying, we all know how to get this started. We're doing a lot of coaching, so that gives me an opportunity to be in classrooms a lot. Um, Alicia Vargas-Smith is also in classrooms coaching many of our preschool and TK teachers, um, and we're having opportunities for teachers to collaborate. Um, and it's one of the things we are dreaming about is having more opportunities to say, wow, let's sit down and talk about this student work. What do you recommend that I do next? And making that really part of our PLC conversation. So it's going to be an opportunity for us to coach so that we continue to keep in that work and don't just sell kids out. Um, so that they will continue to grow.
So when we implement something new, we want the teachers um, to have the support that they need. Um, we have provided book clubs, um, build parties where we purchase interesting items and the teachers uh, were able to come and build their classroom collections. Um, this, for instance, is the picture of the Longfellow cafeteria where it was filled with materials for counting collections. And the teachers were able to come in and pick up and choose what they needed for their collections. Um, we have also set up some launch dates um, to go into teachers' classrooms and get their students started with their counting collections. And we are also providing next step um, conversations um, with teachers so that they can have a thought partner and consider the next step for learning um, with their students. As we uh, deepened our work, we realized that we needed a vision statement for our elementary math program, uh, as well as descriptors of what we wanted to see across our elementary classroom. Uh, would anyone like to volunteer to read our vision statement? All AUS students are problem solvers who make sense of rigorous real world mathematical tasks and communicate their strategies and reasoning in a variety of ways in inclusive learning communities because all students are able to learn mathematics. Thank you, President Greer. And a special uh, attention to all students. We want to make sure that all students have this opportunity um, to live through this vision in our uh, classroom. As part of the process of developing a vision statement, our team described the qualities um, that we should see evident in all our classrooms. Uh, just please take a minute to look at these statements that our team uh, came up with that we would like to see across our classrooms. At the same time, uh, we engaged in learning with our principals, our teachers, our instructional leaders, as we looked at these uh, six high leverage mathematical practices. Uh, this fall, our teachers uh, selected two of these uh, from the vision statement that resonated most with them. Uh, they identified which high leverage math uh, pedagogical practices they would bring, uh, would help them bring these statements to life in their classrooms. Um, we also identified as a district um, that we would be having conversations in math classes where students share uh, ideas with each other. And hopefully you were able to have that experience today. Uh, we also were able to uh, tie these high leverage math practices to our uh, success. Hey, so. As I was beginning to say earlier, uh, we were one of the goals that we had was that all of our multilingual learner students would have a problem, a strategy to be able to problem solve. And we were shooting for 50%. 50% of our multilingual learners would be able to apply a valid strategy to solve a word problem. And we piloted a program solving, solving item with our K3 students to provide us with the data about our effectiveness. We collected data for kinder and first grades in the fall and the spring, and collected data for second and third grades in fall and winter. And that is our data. So assessment A, and we have assessment B. Our data shows that 82.4% of our students had a strategy to solve and add to results unknown problem. And 75.9% of our multilingual learners had a strategy to solve and add to result unknown problem. So we see uh, in assessment B that there is growth in, in the spring and the fall for all of our students. Sorry about that. We are proud to share um, the new goal that has been established by the team. Um, would somebody like to volunteer to read the new goal for us? Mm -hmm. 
by June of 2023, 100% of PK through third grade multilingual learners will be able to apply a valid strategy to solve a word problem as measured by district and early childhood assessment. P3, PK through three multilingual learners will increase by 30% and all students will increase 25% in operations and algebraic thinking as measured by our district assessment. So we, um, as a team, established a lofty goal for ourselves that all of our um, PK3 through third grade multilingual learners will be utilizing a strategy um, to apply to a, a solve a word problem. So that's what we're shooting for. And as we wrap up our collaboration with California Ed Partners, we look to sustaining and scaling this work um, with the district improvement plan. Adult collaborative learning using student work samples from our new assessments um, to anchor our PLC conversations. We are also developing um, counting collections. Oh, sorry. We're also developing opportunities for teachers to collaborate across grade levels in looking at that work um, through their PLC um, team time. We're also looking at the high quality learning experiences um, to deepen our lens for high quality instruction through the six high leverage practices and supporting teachers and coming alongside them with coaching and opportunities for professional learning. Um, we also looking to um, the assessment of learning. Um, PK through second grade will utilize our revised assessments next year and we are piloting some new items for third through fifth grade on this year's assessment. And we are planning to utilize what the team has learned through this process to refine our learning systems and to focus on coherence in the upper grade as well. And now we open it up to questions for all of you. So um, I appreciate that this is, um, that you've taken a strategy and really had people go deep and, and really have um, adoption. I, you know, it is one strategy. It's not a complete pro program. I So I guess the analogy that I'll, that I'll make is that I feel like this feels very similar to where we were when we when we started doing like think pair share and we went deep in that we had everyone do that right or, or we had a different strategy um and now that we're bringing in still and some of the schools are like oh my god we're putting it all together right now it all makes sense I, I know why we were doing these different pieces and so I just wonder about that coherence right and how we make sure that yes we're giving people deep opportunities to put into practice a really strong strategy and do it well, which is important, right? But at the same time, not making people feel like, oh, this is the answer because now our kids know cardinality and can, ordinality can, can now count up to a certain amount, right? Because math is so much more complex than that. So I just, I'm curious about, you know, where is that in your thinking in terms of like, yes, we have a strong strategy. Where is the rest going to, what happens the other four days when the kids do this one day a week? You know, what's happening? So in looking at the articulation plan, you know, the, the focus of, of this work is to establish some strong foundation and to really maximize and benefit that um, work and early learning that students are getting in preschool. And how do we sustain that as students move from preschool through the grade levels? And in looking at how we are weaving these counting collections, when we look at those high leverage math practices, how, do, how are we lifting those up throughout the learning that the students are doing on the other four days outside of counting collections? So what you saw from the responses from the teachers was a, an understanding of, of seeing how students are responding to these opportunities for collaborating around the counting collection. But the power and the collaboration and the questioning of teachers has really shifted the instruction that we see in classrooms. So for example, when we've gone in on site visits, we've seen in almost every classroom that I've been in this year during math time, I've not seen a teacher standing up in front of the room teaching at the whiteboard during math. I see students in collaborative groups. They have manipulatives. They might have their math books. They might have their math boxes. But it's really the, the, strat, the highlight leverage strategies that the teachers are experiencing through the work with counting collections we're seeing come alive through other aspects of mathematics. And so the team is really looking to how do we continue to focus on those 
high leverage strategies to continue to lift that up through the other mathematics work that we're doing. So how are we, or are, are, are we, then how are we exposing teachers? Like, let's say, okay, this is happens once a week, right? Um, and those other four days, maybe they have shapes and they want to start trying to do like tangrams, right? And, you know, how are, how are we giving teachers opportunities to expand, right? What that kind of instruction looks like, right? Because that, in my mind, that is quality, that, that is the best instruction we want to see, right? Hands-on, making connections between my brain and my hands and what, and my, and what's happening in my mouth, right? So, so how are we doing? Julie, do you want to speak a little bit? As, as Irma stated, that it's been really exciting to use this, and I agree completely that this is a jumping off point for us to deepen our practice, and then we continue to build. And it's just like when you have a group of students, all of our teachers are in a different place with this. So some of them have been doing counting collections for four or five years, and they're ready to move on to the next piece. So we have them doing choral counting. We have them supporting students with hands-on work with each of the different problem types. Um, we are looking at all of the routines that are called out in the proposed new framework because um, there are a lot of those that are really used to develop number sense. And we also still have our very strong number sense based math curriculum from everyday math. So we're really integrating this within that. Fortunately, everyday math was written with one day a week available for students to be able to do these kinds of activities and to differentiate instruction. So we're not having to take that away. Instead, we're adding to that so that they, they can deepen that practice. But it's going to be an exciting thing as we build simultaneously um, a lot of different practices as we continue to deepen that. Thanks. And then my other question is really around, um, the, I'm just going to say the kind of framing I'm hearing around English learners or multilingual learners about like, oh, this is going to help them, right? Um, they, they don't have mathematical ish problems, right? The problem is maybe the, how the teacher's delivering language and how they're understanding, right? And so I worry about that connection, thinking about, oh, we're going to group special ed and EL students because they're so far behind. They're, they're behind probably because what's happening in the classroom and how the teacher is either differentiating or scaffolding, right, and making it accessible to those students. And so I just wonder about that and how you're framing that so that your teachers understand, you know, how to decide the, the kind of support students need, right? I think this is intimately tied to this idea of we have dual language learners. How are we supporting them in early years and supporting their primary language? Right. But I'm just wondering about that as well, because I, I, I'm kind of hearing that undertone about like, oh, we have the EL and the SPEDs and we're going to be focusing on those two groups. So in terms of identifying those groups to look up or to lift up is really to really focus on the achievement of those groups and to ensure that those groups of students aren't left behind. But particularly um, through the work that we see um, posted here with the high leverage practices and the tied to success drivers, we have been very intentional about how we are looking at language for all students, how we are tying the work that we are doing during our instructional um, leaders meetings um, and our coaching um, and support of principals and their instructional leadership. Um, we had an opportunity to, to weave um, I believe it was in our last IL um, with our ELA TOSAs and with Julie, how do we lift up a language function through a small group mathematics lesson? And when we think about the counting collection, it really lends itself to that opportunity for all students to engage um, through the multiple modalities that you described. You got to, you know, you said you were a hands-on learner having, you know, the various tools and students are able to express all of those things. But we really lift up those groups of students because we want to ensure that the work and the instruction that is being provided in the classroom is giving them that access, that entry point, so that they are successful. Yes, my question was, you know, I like how you have set goals where you're going to be at in June 2023. So. Um, uh, how can you tell if these students understand? I mean, do they take like a test or is it by their test taking? How do we get to know if they're getting it, right? So we developed some um, assessments that, I, that are correlated directly to this work, um, to be able to pull that data to, to know whether or not we have met those. And plus the teachers walk around the classroom to listen, Ms. Nogal did in, in, you know, 
just let us listen to what the rationale behind why we want where we got where we're at, right? So you ask these questions of the students. So <clears throat> you know they understand, right? That's, they have the opportunity. Yeah, yeah th that's really good. I, I, I really like this um, yeah, counting. And, and yeah. you know, when teachers are walking doing questioning, they're able to differentiate their questions for students um, based on, on where they are and, and moving them to the next level. So if teachers are doing, like they're collecting a lot of data about students and student learning and what am I doing next to move this student on and on. Well, it's like the teacher's asking the question, not telling them because, you know, this supposed to ask us a question and um, Latasha and I would look at each other like, you know, who's going to answer? But, you know, I, I think it's good because you answer what you see or why you got where you're at. And that's problem solving. And I think that's really great to start the kids so young in math, because I know math is one of the hardest for myself, even in um, grade school going on and to start so young and, and to, it's more about understanding it, not just doing the problem, but problem solving is understanding why you got where you're at. So I, I really like this whole method here. Or, um, student learning. Yeah, and the questioning is key because the teacher isn't telling the student the information. Mm -hmm. They are asking the students the question, drawing that learning from. Yeah, I want to thank you all for the great presentation. It was really good. And just a couple, couple of comments. Yeah, great, great presentation. Thank you for sharing uh, this with us and giving us not only a descriptive glimpse, but even giving us the opportunity to experience it our, ourselves, uh, hands-on, <laughs> kind of along those lines. I know I personally, for one, would even love an opportunity to even get in a classroom and see some of this in, in action. So if, if something like that could be arranged, I know I, I would, would love to be uh, on that opportunity. We are planning some learning walks very soon, so okay. we will absolutely invite okay. I love it. love it. Oh, but thank you. Any other questions or comments? Thank you all very much. Well, that then brings us to the next item on our agenda, which is 7.0 and specifically, excuse me, 7.1 adjournment. Is there a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion to adjourn. Just for you, Adrian. The second. <laughs> and just a comment. Uh, just want to, again, want to say thank you, Philanine, as we are, are signing off here. Um, just again, grateful. It's been an honor uh, to serve and, and sit here on this board and serve with you. And well, a comment to Adrian. Welcome back. <laughs> All right. <laughs> all right. Then we will go ahead and are you all signed in? We'll do a vote. Yeah. We'll, do, we'll go and vote online. Yes. So uh, Board Member Rodriguez Pena is a yes. Board Member Cruz Gonzalez? Yes. And I, Board Member Greer, am also a yes. And so therefore, the motion to adjourn passes three yes to two absent. And we are formally adjourned at 7.10 p.m. Thank you so much, everyone.